Um, so as, as Paul said, in late 2019, we commemorated Sydney Airport's centenary. Um, we are one of the oldest operating airports in the world or continuously operating airports in the world. So we turn 102 in a matter of weeks. Um, though as you'll see in a moment, the first flight on the site of today's airport actually took place somewhat earlier in 1911 uh, from what was then called the Ascot race course. So the history of aviation at that site has gone right back to 1911, which as you know, is only a few years after the Wright brothers and only 17 years after um, Lawrence Hargrave. So there's been an aviation presence in that part of Sydney for pretty much the entire history of global aviation, which is pretty remarkable. This evening, I'll take you through a potted history from 1911 to the present day, and then touch on the future, um, which, uh, which is quite interesting at the moment, obviously. So far as the present's concerned, of course, it's all about the impact of COVID-19, uh, but we are coming out of that, as I'll show. So this is the first flight, 18th of April, 1911. This picture was taken, front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. New Zealand aviator Joseph Joel, or Joe Hammond, became the first person to fly from the site that became today's Sydney Airport. Um, it was then the Ascot race course, and you can see the, the grandstand in the background there. Photographer from the Herald was there and captured the moment, the very first flight at the airport. Um, as I said, only 17 years after Lawrence Hargrave took to the sky, not that far to the south of the airport, down at Stanwell Tops, probably only about 30, 35 kilometres away, um, and only um, eight years actually after the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk in the US. Hammond was from New Zealand, and his school in Wellington reported that, and I quote, he never knew what fear was. He had a passionate love for any vocation that held the promise of excitement and danger. His early exploits on horseback earned him the nickname Daredevil Joe. So he was kind of almost born to be an aviator. So it was destiny, I think, he became an expert aviator at the age of 23, having learned to fly in just 10 days. Very interesting character. He'd also been a gold prospector in the Klondike, a trapper in Alaska, and a cowboy in Buffalo Bill's Circus. So he got around. He would fly 17 more times in Sydney, each time witnessed by thousands of enthralled Sydney siders who each paid half a crown for the privilege. This is a closer view of Hammond's biplane. It was made of light wood, Egyptian cotton, and was held together by paste and piano wire. It had a wingspan of just over 10 metres and weighed in at a mere 500 kilograms. The first flight attained a height of only 40 metres and lasted less than 10 minutes. So today, you compare that to an A380 flying from Sydney Airport, made of high strength, lightweight materials, weighs about 560 tonnes, has a wingspan of 80 metres, a range of 15,400 kilometres, and can seat around 500 passengers. And in flight, it will attain a height of around 12 kilometres. It's always amazed me that aviation has gone from what we see in the picture here to an A380 in just over 100 years. Quite, quite extraordinary. Now, like many pioneer aviators, Hammond flew during the Great War. He served with the Royal Flying Corps, including at the front in France in 1914. He would rise to the rank of captain. He became a test pilot, and while flying in the United States in support of a war bomb drive, he tragically died only weeks before the end of the war on the 22nd of September 1918, when his plane crashed coming into land. Now, at Sydney Airport, as, as, as Paul would know, we're very keen, and I'm certainly keen to always celebrate our history. The, the people who work at the airport are, are thrilled to know the history of the airport. Uh, it really excites, um, excites the team. So back in 1911, or the, sorry, the 18th of April, 2011, which is the 100th anniversary of that first flight, we commemorated uh, that. Um, we engaged um, two actors, um, the two on the right, and I had great fun finding a Model T Ford and a driver to reenact Hammond arriving at the airport. Um, for those with long memories like me, you might remember the, the Artie Jack program on the ABC. The, the actor in the middle we engaged to play Hammond, his name's John Derham, and he was one of the Artie Jack uh, actors back in the late 60s and early 70s. And that was a great fun. Now, turning next to who I believe to be the most important person in Sydney Airport's history. Um, and unfortunately, one of our least known, that's something I'm trying to rectify. And that's our founder, Nigel Love. And you can see a picture of Nigel here. It's, it's a shame that few people have heard of Nigel, uh, but given his preeminent role in 
founding Sydney Airport, as well as his many other aviation achievements, which I'll mention in a moment, we've done our best to make sure people know who Nigel was and what he did. Now, I think he was in many respects Australia's greatest aviator, as, as I think you'll see. Um, we've named uh, our main office building at the airport after Nigel, the Nigel Love Building, and a, uh, a bridge over the Alexandra Canal is the Nigel Love Bridge. You might notice if you're driving along next to the airport. Now, like Hammond, um, Nigel Love, who's in the middle of this photograph, flew during the war, it's a great war. He flew in three squadron, Australian Flying Corps, and saw active service in various theatres, including above the Somme battlefield. There he faced up against the German ace, the Baron von Richthofen, better known, of course, as the Red Baron. One of Nigel's tasks was to map enemy trenches from above, flying slowly at low altitude and draw the position of trenches in a notebook that he had balanced on his lap. A notebook that still exists to this day, and I've seen it, but I've seen it at the home of Nigel's son, John. It is a quite remarkable document, the detail in the diagrams of the trenches is quite extraordinary. Now, when you consider the fact the enemy would have fought, been firing up at him uh, from below, you get an idea of just how courageous Nigel and these other wartime aviators were at the time. And their life expectancy, I've heard John say, was measured in weeks. Um, so incredibly dangerous. So, and um, there's an entry in Nigel's diary, which again is quite remarkable, 21st of April, 19. He records in his diary that they believed they had shot down the Red Baron's plane over Australian lines. Um, and in fact, that was confirmed. Um, so there was some controversy about who shot down Rick Tovin, and it it's, appears to be quite genuinely, it was Australians who shot him down. But such was the respect for the Baron and between the two sides, they gave him a full military funeral. Um, and Nigel was present at that funeral. So after the war, uh, Nigel returned from the battlefields of Western Europe in 1919, and he selected a bullock paddock near Cook's River in Mascot, on which his company, the Australian Aircraft and Engineering Company, would assemble and fly the Avro 504K aircraft. The site was recommended to him by Rain and Horn Real Estate agent in the city, and you can see that not, Nigel's hangar here is circled in green in relation to today's airport. The site would have been pretty much at the end of the, pass of the passenger pier at T2, if you know Sydney Airport's uh, Terminal 2. Um, the Ascot race course is out of shot to the left of the photo. And in the distance, you can see market gardens um, and the like. One of those areas of market gardens exists to this day um, off in uh, towards Bexley. So that bullet paddock became today's Sydney airport. You can see the Cooks River up in the top there. Um, that's the original location of the Cooks River. Um, it originally flowed through the middle of the airport. The river had to be moved in the 1950s to reconfigure the runways to their present north, south and east, west direction. So I'm sure that could never happen today to actually move a river. In fact, only up until a few years ago when the old Rockdale City and City of Botany Bay councils were amalgamated to form the Bayside Council, you could see the presence of the former river across the airport because it was the old local government boundary between the two former councils snaking through the airport um, uh, like an S in the middle of the airport. Here you can see a closer view of both the hangar and the Avro 504K aircraft. Uh, that were being manufactured in nearby Mascot, then transported to the on-airport airport hangar to be assembled on site. And of course, I'm sure many of you would have seen the replica um, Avro 504K on the departure level of the Qantas T3 terminal here at Sydney. As managing director and chief test pilot, Nigel Love then flew the first flight, carrying the new airport's very first passenger, Mr. Billy Marshall. I'll return to Mr. Marshall later in the presentation. So April 1920, Nigel also flew the first commercial flight, passenger flight from Sydney to Melbourne. Pre-COVID, that was the second busiest air route in the world. Nigel Love's company also supplied Qantas with its very first passenger commercial aircraft. So as I said, the achievements of Nigel, so many firsts, so many important firsts, make him an incredibly important character. Here you can see the Avro in flight high above the airport and see Botany Bay in the background. So those firsts just emphasised how important a figure he was in Australia's aviation history. 
Paul mentioned earlier um, about the the engine of the um, of the aircraft that's being restored. That's very relevant here because um, Nigel also built the first aircraft for the what who became the RAAF. And you can see here the, the aircraft coming off the production line. This was the first of the RAAF's Avro aircraft. It was commissioned in 921. We had hoped to celebrate the centenary of that important historical achievement back in June, but unfortunately the border closures in June beat us to it by a matter of weeks. I'm hopeful we can do something, <coughs> excuse me, to recognise that in the, in the future. Um, but that, there you have the first RAAF aircraft. Now, if you can forgive me just for a moment of self-indulgence, one reason I have a deep interest in aviation history is to do with my uncle Christopher, Christopher Dole, you can see pictured here. Pictured with his Spitfire, he flew for five and a half years with the RAF during the Second World War, including during the Battle of Britain. He was nicknamed the singing pilot because of his amazing baritone voice, which I can still hear in my ears to this day, and was known to have said, quote, I've always been very lucky an understatement when you consider the fact he was actually shot down twice and had to bail out three times, including over the channel. Um, so he was incredibly lucky to survive the full five and a half years of the Second World War flying Spitfires and, and other times hurricanes. Now, turning to other great Australian aviation pioneers uh, who were linked to Sydney Airport, as I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, flying the Southern Cross with co-commander Charles Ulm, navigator Harry Lyon and radio operator Jim Warner. Charles Kingsford Smith completed the world's first trans-Pacific flight from the United States to Australia in 1928, landing first in Brisbane and then flying on to Sydney. The largest crowd of Sydney sizes then ever gathered, 300,000 out of a population of 1.2 million, was at the airport to greet them. That's a quarter of Sydney's population. Today, that would be about 1.5 million people. So it gives you an idea of just how many Sydney siders actually um, went to the airport to, to see uh, Smithy and the crew um, return to Sydney. Also with Olin, of course, he flew a record-breaking circumnavigation of Australia in 1927. And he also played a significant role in Sydney Airport's history, both as a pilot and joint founder with Olin of Australian National Airways Limited in December 1928. Now, one of Kingston Smith's flying jackets um, we have had restored is on loan from the Liverpool and District Historical Society. I had a call in, I think it was early 2018 um, from the society and they, and they basically said, look, we've got this old Charles Kingston Smith jacket. Um, do, you, do you want it? And of course the answer was yes. The condition, of course, was we had to have it restored and put it on display. So we've done both. It's now on display in our main office building called the Nigel Love Building uh, at Sydney Airport. And you can see the jacket here, and it may well be the one that was worn on that first Trans-Pacific flight. Um, we can confirm it, it, it is genuine. It is, it is a Charles Kingston Smith jacket. Standing on either side, you can see our chief executive, Jeff Colbert, um, and then the other is, is Smithy's grand and nephew, Leah Frey Kingsford Smith. And next to him is the federal member for Kingsford Smith, uh, Matt Thistlethwaite. Uh, so that was a great, a great thing uh, to do. I'm hopeful we can put that on display in the T1 terminal so it can be uh, seen by more, more and more people because it's a very significant aviation artifact. As I said, we like to celebrate our history and our heritage of the airport, particularly those great aviation pioneers. And this is another example, June 2019, as I said, we named our main building, uh, the Nigel Love Building, which is in the International Terminal Precinct. We also named what was the old Customs House, which is another building in that Terminal Precinct after Charles Ulm. Um, so it was a great, great ceremony, an honour to have the Love and the Ulm families, um, as well as the Kings of Smith families and Nancy Bird Walton's um, daughter, um, we had the descendant of Billy Marshall, the first passenger, and we had them all in the one room, which was just fantastic, a very special occasion. There were four generations of the Love family and the Alm family there, which was amazing. Top, flight, top photo, you can see uh, um, John Love, his second from the right there, and he's Nigel's son. Um, and the bottom photo, um, you can see Charles Arm Olm, who's the grandson of Charles Olm, and an uncanny resemblance, I think you'll agree. 
um, with the uh, with the Ulm building plaque. We were joined then by the then Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormack, and again our local MP for Kings of Smith, Matt Thistlethwaite. Another significant event also occurred in early 1920. That was the arrival of Ross and Keith Smith in their twin engine Vicky Vickers Vimy. They'd just flown from England, picking up a 10,000 pound prize, which is a huge amount of money in those days, offered by uh, Australian PM Billy Hughes. And to win, they had to do so in less than 30 days. Uh, they made it, um, landing on the 12th of November, 1919 in Darwin after 28 days. So they just made it. Um, on this 10th of December, 1919. The original plan was to complete, complete the journey by flying direct to Melbourne, but having none of that, Nigel Love, then based at Sydney Airport and just opened the airport, lobbied New South Wales Premier to get them to fly to Sydney first and then on to Melbourne. And he succeeded in that, so you can see them landing here on the 14th of February, 1920. Um, and when our new parallel north-south runway opened in 1994, a Vickers Vimy aircraft replica was the first aircraft to land on that runway. Fast forward to 1933, and here we see the great Nancy Bird Walton at Sydney Airport's Kingsford Smith Flying School. Now, of course, Nancy has been um, appropriately and well honoured by having the new Western Sydney Airport named after her, which is, uh, which is great to see. When she was awarded a commercial pilot's licence at the age of 19, Nancy bought her first aircraft, the Havilland Gypsy Moth, and like the one shown here. Soon after, she took off on a barnstorming tour, dropping in on country fairs, giving joy rides for people who've never seen aircraft, let alone a female pilot. And while touring, Bird met Reverend Stanley Drummond, and he wanted her to help set up a flying medical service in Outback New South Wales. So in 1935, she was hired to operate that service, and her own Gypsy Moth was used as an air ambulance. Soon after the Second World War broke out, she began training women in skills needed to back up the men flying in the RAAF. Now, I often say the airport, Sydney Airport is in many ways implicated in a lot of the most iconic events in Australian history. Um, you see one of them here, I'm sure people would recognise the photograph. Uh, it's one of the more iconic photographs taken at the airport. This was back in 1954 the height of the Cold War and uh, the so-called Petrov affair, of course. And here we see armed KGB agents escorting the wife of then third secretary of the Soviet embassy in Canberra and then defector to the West to an aircraft to fly her back to the Soviet Union, where she would have no doubt faced a grim future. Luckily, ASIO managed to seize her from the KGB when the plane landed in Darwin by saying it was illegal to carry arms on an aircraft. So she and husband Vladimir Petrov were subsequently offered asylum in Australia, which they, of course, accepted. Another iconic image, that's Louis Armstrong, or Satchmo. He arrived in Sydney Airport 1956 to a welcome from the Sydney Jazz Club. And, of course, he serenaded the crowd on his arrival. Another iconic image, this photograph was taken about three weeks after I was born, 11th of June 1964. Thousands of screaming fans huddled in the pouring rain to greet um, the Beatles. The platform on which they stood is still there. You can see it. It's uh, adjacent to what is that was our first control tower in between the T2 and T3 terminals. Now, interestingly, one beetle was missing. Um, the observer amongst you may be thinking, who's the person on the right under the umbrella? Um, there are three others, George, Paul, and John, who's obscured on the left. Um, the man on the right, his name's Jimmy Nicholl, and he was standing in for Ringo, who had been hospitalised in London with a sore throat. He was to join them on the tour later on. Now 81, there's a very sad photo of Jimmy Nicholl leaving Australia uh, a week later, sitting alone in the terminal departure lounge, and you can see that photo here. Somewhat quiet a departure compared to when he had arrived uh, a week before. Many years later, he said, standing in for Ringo was the worst thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> he went to the, the, the peak of fame to uh, a deep trough of not being recognised. Then we entered the age of supersonic aircrafts, and also an age when people could wander on the tarmac and willy-nilly to look at aircraft close up. Um, the only supersonic aircraft to enter wide commercial service was, of course, the Anglo-French Concorde, which first arrived at Sydney Airport in 1972. Qantas taking out options on the purchase of the aircraft, the pressure was on for Sydney Airport to cater for its operations. 
This included an extension of our main runway into Botany Bay, which you can see in the distance there, lengthening the runway to almost two and a half kilometres. The extended runway opened in 1968. Now, of course, for noise related reasons, the Concorde was never to fly to Australia regularly. Um, simultaneously, the government announced in 65 that it would build a new international terminal on the then unused western side of the airport site. That new terminal was opened um, by the Queen in 1970, meaning T1 um, turned 50 years last year. Again, we were unable to celebrate the <laughs> That, uh, that achievement because of, because of COVID. But there you can see the international terminal. So we extended the runway to make way for an aircraft that ended up never flying uh, to Sydney in any appreciable numbers. But of course, um, it could take uh, 747s and the like and A380s today. So you all recognize Sydney Airport today, very distinctive uh, runway layout. The, the shape of the runway is the cruciform shape you can see there is actually um, heritage listed. Um, because of its distinctive, um, well, it, it just screams Sydney Airport. People who see that can see Sydney Airport. Um, as I said, main runway was lengthened in the 60s to 2,440 metres, 2.5 kilometres. Its current length is just under four kilometres. That makes it one of the longest runways, certainly in the Southern Hemisphere, and, and almost certainly one of the longest in the world. In contrast, the east-west runway, which you can see the cross runway there and the parallel north-south runway on the right are only about 2.5 kilometres in length. Now, the airport's also relatively small, 907 hectares, and that includes the areas reclaimed from Botany Bay. I say small because Brisbane is 2,700 hectares, Melbourne 2,600, Perth 2,100, and Western Sydney Airport is 1,800 hectares. So we're pretty small in terms of area. Now, like all airports, Sydney Airport makes a significant contribution to the local economy. Um, and through the global pandemic, that's unfortunately reduced the contribution. But in 2019, the airport generated uh, or provided $42 billion in economic activity and supported the direct and indirect employment of 340,000 people. That's equivalent to 10% of New South Wales employment and included 33,000 direct jobs in the airport site. So the airport is a huge, as all airports are, huge economic generators. We were proud in 2007, October, to welcome the world's first ever commercial A380 service. This was actually the first week I arrived um, when, when this, this happened. We had several hundred aviation journalists from around the world out on a rather wet and windy airfield to witness the event. As I mentioned earlier, when you compare this aircraft to what Joe Hammond was flying just over 100 years earlier, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Aviation activity forecasting undertaken as part of our master planning process is um, actually assuming that um, there will be fewer A380s flying in the future. Um, that's because well, a few things. First of all, they have four engines. They use a lot of fuel compared to twin engine aircraft. Fuel, of course, is a huge expense for airlines. Um, and also with so many passengers, 500 plus, um, the belly hold is full of bags, as you'd expect. That leaves very little room for air freight. And it's air freight that often makes the commercial difference for a particular flight being viable or not. So A380s, ironically, are probably too big. So the airlines now, as we're seeing with Qantas, going back to 787s and, and A350s and the like there. 2019, we had 44.4 million passengers, um, 350,000 flights, so close to 1,000 a day. In September 2019, just before um, COVID, we actually welcomed our one billionth passenger. I went back through all the records and as close as I could get it to, we, we uh, determined that the one billionth passenger would pass through the T1 terminal on the 5th of September, 2019. So that was a, a big event uh, on that day. And uh, a passenger was designated, a, a, a young 12-year-old uh, girl who had a great time because she was passenger one billion and uh, Singapore Airlines uh, gave them some free flights and the like, which was great. You can also see this photo demonstrates very clearly why Sydney Airport is such an economic engine. And that is in part, in major part, because of its proximity to the Sydney CBD, only uh, five and a half kilometres. 
That brings with it, of course, noise related issues because there's a lot of people live in that area. So noise has always been and always will be an issue at the airport. So that takes us to 2020 um, and into this year. The last 18 months, the impact of course has been severe on aviation and airports and airlines. We estimate in recent months, we were down to 1% of 2019 passenger numbers. Now, those numbers have not been seen since 1960. Uh, my rough calculation, the number of flights we saw at the depth of COVID was equivalent to somewhere in the 1950s. So that gives you an idea of just the depth of the downturn. Nevertheless, we had to keep the airport operating day to day, 24 seven to accommodate repatriation flights, freight and other flights, uh, even though the financial loss to the company was significant in doing so. Our charges for airlines are based on per passenger. Um, so we had flights coming in uh, like A350 aircraft that would have two passengers on them and the, the, the rest of the plane would be full of freight. So we would get paid by that airline uh, about $42. Uh, yet the plane would, it would cost us about $10,000 to service. So we were losing money hand over fist for that 18 months. Um, interesting phenomenon we saw last year and into this year, we had all sorts of unusual aircraft flying into Sydney. This of course is the Antonov. Ironically today, we welcome two more of these air Antonovs flying into Sydney. Last year, they were bringing um, firefighting helicopters for the Rural Fire Service. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's what they were doing today, delivering uh, helicopters for the RFS. We also saw a Mongolian airline, which was unusual, and African airlines we'd never seen in Sydney before. That's because airlines were deploying um, all sorts of aircraft to keep freight moving. E-commerce freight in particular has gone gangbusters. It was going up significantly before COVID and has gone up exponentially since. So one thing COVID has done has really put a rocket under the air freight market, which is good. So a few flights in the air, uh, airlines had to park their aircraft, of course. A lot of them took them to Mojave Desert in the United States. Here in Sydney, we temporarily closed our East West runway to park grounded aircraft. And you can see some of them here. Quite remarkable to see planes uh, stacked up in that way. Another phenomenon we've seen is because airlines are looking to save and cut costs, be as efficient as possible, the shift to the quiet next generation aircraft like the 787 and A350 appears to have been accelerated. These aircraft are incredibly fuel efficient compared to the, say, the 747s. Um, so airlines are, are really putting these into service. That's not just good news for fuel efficiency and lower emissions. Uh, these aircraft are significantly quieter than the other aircraft. So that's a, a very positive uh, phenomenon for our local community. Now, the fact the airport's opening up again is good. This gives you an idea of just the value of international aviation to the economy. $100 billion a year, uh, 515,000 jobs across Australia. Freight is 34 billion of that, so about a third. Holidays, tourism is only 13 billion. That's a lot of money, but it's not as much as you might think. The big uh, number there you can see is education. $40 billion generated for the economy from international students and their uh, visiting friends and relatives coming into, the, into Australia. So the sooner we can get international students back into our universities, uh, that those numbers will start recovering. I'll end on an optimistic note. As of this Monday, um, we started opening up again when the uh, state government removed the need for uh, two weeks quarantine for inbound passengers and also allowed Australians to leave the country uh, without, without permission. Our prediction um, is optimistic, where, and I'll quote from our media release, the recovery is expected to reach 16% of pre-COVID international seat capacity by the end of this month, increasing to nearly 40% in January 22. Domestic seat capacity is expected to grow from 25% of pre-COVID this month to 89% in January 22. So you can see the recovery um, quite rapid. The pent up demand to travel is extraordinary. We saw that when we briefly opened up from about March to mid June this year. Um, so we're expecting that uh, the number of flights is gonna increase quickly and significantly. And I would hope that within two years or perhaps sooner, we'll be back to 2019 levels and, and growing again. And these last two images, very emotional day on Monday, 
with uh, a lot of the returning Australians coming in. And of course, it was a media frenzy, as you'd expect. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. I'm very happy to ask, answer questions, I should say. I'll stop sharing. Uh, it's Warwick Bigsworth here. I'm wondering about the um, what your projected impact is on the opening of the um, Western Sydney Airport in 2025 or 26. This is our, our master plan. Um, as you said, Western Sydney Airport opens in what well, we they say they're on, on, on schedule to open in December 24, 2026. I'll show you that's, I don't know if you can see that the passenger forecast, but you can see the dip in passengers in 2026. Um, so that there will be um, a shift of passengers from Kingsford Smith to Western Sydney. Um, but Western, but Kingsford Smith will then uh, grow, start growing again, albeit at a slightly slower rate. And there's a similar pattern for um, flight numbers. That's the equivalent diagram for freight. You can see again the dip there. Um, Western Sydney Airport, it's it's approved at the moment to go to 10 million passengers, I think in 20 by 2030. So they'll need approvals to go beyond that. But we'd anticipate, say, by 2070, thereabouts, you're going to have two airports about the same size on either end of Sydney, um, much like Tokyo, I guess, with um, the two airports there. So Western Sydney will be a great success. There's no doubt about that. Um, there's huge demand, sorry, huge population and economic activity in Western Sydney. So um, it's long overdue they're getting getting that airport. So that's, that's very good news for the people of Western Sydney. Yep. Hi, right, Ted. Dennis Smith. Um, just a little bit of trivia. Um, I was at the cinema last week at Roseville, one of the Sydney suburban years, and ran into uh, John Ong, the son of Charles, and he oh. had his son. He had his son there as well. He's uh, just turned a hundred. I know. And, he's, and he was out and about, was he? That's great. Yeah, yeah, he's gone to the cinema. He's had a bit of a one of those zinger things to push himself along, but yeah. he was living uh, only uh, about two streets from me in Greenwich. Which we yeah, moved out I just, just recently. About two years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, he's uh, moved, has he? Or? Yeah, you, you, no, I, I moved. Oh, you moved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a remarkable yeah. character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he, he knew Paul Brickhill quite well. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, really? yeah. Because he was flying Spitfires, got shot down in That's right, he was too, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was just interesting to see that well, I wasn't sure if he was still alive. He, he would be only about one of about three Spitfire. Pilots from the Second World War still yeah. alive, I think. Not yeah. That, yeah, my uncle died oh, mm. 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Not, not that many. No, no, John is a remarkable character because he was a journalist and wrote for The Sun for a while as well. Yes, yeah. Well, that's that, that's why he had an interest with Paul Brickhill because he, yeah. his personal friend living just down the road from him in Greenwich, yeah. was Peter Fitch, the actor. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, they both went to North Sydney Boys High School together and then it was Peter Finch, I think, that talked him into going into the newspapers as right. copy boy, you know, oh, before the war, you know. And and Charles, yeah, the, his son, you know? it's a remarkable resemblance with with Charles Owen. Yes, <laughs> you yeah, sort of yeah. shake your head when you see. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks for a great talk. It's interesting. One very quick question: that the Western Airport, um, how are they going to select which destinations? Are going to be flying in and out of that because living in close to the Sydney airport, I'm only you know 20 minutes away maximum. Mm. What's going to happen if the flight I want to go to is is flying out of bloody Western Creek at Eastern Creek? You know? yeah, it's a good question. I've raised that with with our people, and what they say is it's it's market driven. Um, so an, an airline won't won't fly to or from Western Sydney Airport unless they can make a quid. Mm. So the early destinations, I think, are fun. There'll be a lot of domestic traffic, Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, you know, Sydney, Ballon, the Byron, things like that, and probably international destinations like Fiji and maybe South East Asia. Uh, but I don't think you're going to get flights out there that wouldn't fly from Sydney. Um, yeah, hopefully. Yep. Yeah. So, but, but as I said, there's, there's a lot of people live out there. Um, and... It, for them to get to Kingsford Smith, particularly if traffic's a problem, it can take them hours. Mm. So the fact they'll have an airport on their doorstep is is a good thing. Mm. Um, as long but, as they um, don't take it away from ours. <laughs> no, well, no, the, the, the airlines will choose to fly from yeah. either airport or both. Or, 
I guess the, the one advantage they've got over us, and I'm, I'm not using this to question our curfew, but they um, they haven't got a curfew, uh, whereas we do, of course. So they may well be able to attract airlines uh, to that airport that can't fly the Kings of Smith because of our curfew. Mm. Um, like Melbourne has got you know, a number of flights that are around you know, between midnight and 1am and things like that. Mm. So they may get to those. Yeah, yeah Cathy asked a, a question just a while ago. Was um, it intended that uh, Western Sydney would be more freight than passengers? Um, no, I mean, that, that they yeah. will be a, a, a strong freight airport, as we are. And the reason I say that is 80% of air freight is actually carried in passenger aircraft, mm -hmm. only 20% in dedicated freighters. So um, while ever Sydney has got so many passenger aircraft, we're going to have a, a, a lot of air freight coming in in those in those planes. That said, Western Sydney, um, I think they're going out to tender now for uh, construction of a large cargo precinct. Um, so that, that will be a very strong focus for them, which is good. Um, but I don't think it will dilute Sydney Airport's uh, role in the freight industry, particularly that e-commerce freight um, coming in, <coughs> uh, which, as I said, is growing very strongly. That, um, there's another airline apparently going to come onto the market, Bonza Airlines. Um, what would be the gate sort of situation? Would you have capacity at a gate or um, would it be walk on, walk off the tarmac? Are there some plans to accommodate them at Sydney or...? Is it early days? Yeah, you know, I've not heard of them, but um, it depends when they want to arrive. Well, we're, uh, because you, you'd probably know we're capped at 80 flights an hour um, in our peak, well, in 2019 in our peak, uh, slots in the peak were very hard to get. So if, if they wanted to arrive at a time when there were no slots available, that would be a problem. Uh, but there's lots of spare capacity uh, during the day, for instance. And if low-cost airlines particularly, they're not that necessarily sensitive to having arrived, like a lot of the um, full-service airlines arrive just after 6 a.m. to say 6 to 8 a.m. A low-cost carrier is quite comfortable flying in at, I'd say, arriving at 11 a.m. because they can leave their home port at 3 a.m. That's why they're low-cost. Um, and then they get the passengers off, get the new ones on, and they depart at 1 p.m. So the turnaround time is pretty quick. So it really depends when they want to fly into the into Sydney. Mm. Thank you, Ted. It's uh, John Booth here. Ted, is it possible to look at the very early black and white aerial shot again of Ascot Racecourse with the? Uh, yeah. I just want a bit if you could point out a bit of the geography and which way is north and south and stuff, just for orientation for me. Thanks, mate. I'll just get it back on. Is that Botany Bay to the... That's up Botany Bay up there. Okay, so that's south, yeah. So that's uh, General... Well, what is today's General Homes Drive? Yes. Going along there. Our main runway now sort of goes out that direction. That yeah. yeah. T2, the terminal T2 is here. Yes. The race course is kind of just off to the left there. Okay. And this is the, the bullet, so-called bullet paddock. Okay. Now that Cook River, is that now... The river that goes north of the international terminal? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was moved over that direction. So on the left of the picture, yeah. where the Cook River exits the picture, is that where the Cook River goes out to the bay? No, the Cook <laughs> River now goes out to the bay about there. Oh, okay. Where did it originally go out to the bay? Uh, just to the left here. Near okay, the, thanks. Yeah, okay. Near Port yeah. Botany today. All right, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's Warwick Henry. Can I... Can I... Mentioned. Oh, that get the picture there. Oh, can <laughs> we get it back on? I was just going to point out the railway line. Oh yes, there is yeah. a railway line. You're right. Yeah. Down the bottom left, they're running left and right. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And at one stage, a runway crossed the railway line. And at one stage, this is we had a bingle with a train. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a railway line. They detoured the railway, railway line and made more space available on the ground. And the, Southern side of Ireland. Why was all of that area still available for an airport? Was it flood prone? You couldn't have suburbs on it? Yeah, I've not thought about that, but I suspect that's right. That was the delta for the Cooks River. Um, so it, it would have been quite marshy. The, the water table, even to this day, is only about two metres below the surface. So I suspect it was, um, yeah, like a mosquito ridden. <laughs> 
uh, swamp, basically, um, not for habitable housing. <coughs> Uh, I know there were night soil disposal areas there and all sorts of things, as I said, market gardens. So it was just never developed for housing, whereas what became the suburb of Mascot just to the east certainly was. So, yeah, so I suspect the land was just not seen as suitable for, for housing, but, but was for well, grazing cattle in the first instance and then, uh, then as an airport. Of course, Sydney was so much smaller in those days, 100 years ago. Yeah, a lot of land around available now, so. I think um, just to add to the point, uh, the area was um, quite contaminated in the, I believe, from what history I know, mid late nineteenth century, early twentieth. Yeah. There was a there was a leather tanning works down there, and um, a sewage pumping station. Some of you may have seen the the large concrete sort of storm channels and yes. effluent towers and everything. And I think that's. The, the marshes there were poorly drained and not suitable for for um, any form of uh, residential living even then. Yeah. No, that, that's absolutely correct. The tannery, I think it was more than one, there were lots of tanneries in the old Botany industrial area and they used a chemical, uh, chemicals called chromates, yep. which are very toxic. And the water, uh, one of the aquifers there is contaminated to this day <laughs> with, with chromium um, contamination. So that's a legacy from the 19th and early 20th century. Now, if, if I may, just a bit of um, a personal side to the, uh, the airport. Dr. Bill Bradfield was very instrumental in the development of yeah, the uh, so. airport after the war. And he told me that um, uh, where the international terminal is, was originally a rubbish dump, which attracted birds and of course, birds and aircraft don't go all that well yeah. together. So he arranged with the local gas works to have all the coke um, dumped on the site so, so as to obliterate the, the tip yeah. and um, get rid of the birds. So that's a nice sort of a, a personal yeah. uh, good, a good field story about the airport. Yeah, no, you're correct. There were, there were rubbish dumps around the place and attracting thousands of seagulls. Ted, are there any uh, proposals to produce uh, sort of a centenary book as per the 80th anniversary book? Do you know? Uh, there, there wasn't at the time, so that, that, that ship may well have sailed. Um, right, yeah. I, I think our people did look into it, um, but it, it was decided not to. Mm. But you're right, we did one in 80 and 85, I think. Um, yes, and then there was that other one from Bullocks to... Yeah, Boeing's, yeah. That's it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can't get the movie up, unfortunately. It, but if you Google GEO, G U I W L A U X, and it's the first video that comes up. And it's got a picture of um, the crash of uh, his aircraft on April, on August the 2nd, uh, 1914, and a picture of him taking off uh, on, the, on the race course. And I often wondered whether it was accurate or not, but I recognised the buildings that. Uh, you saw in the Hammond picture. So if you just Google GEO and um, get the Sunny first video, again. it's G-U-I-L-L-A-U-X. G-U-I-L-L-A-U-X. Okay, I'll do that next time. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's, there's only about 15 seconds of movie of the, of, uh, on Ascot, Ascot <coughs> Race Course, but I do think it might be the first movie taken in the area. Oh, it would have been for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the uh, airport is in the process of being taken over by other operators or another operator. Um, is there any change in the, uh, or do you believe there will be any change in the strategy for the uh, future development of the airport as um, a result of that takeover? Yeah, first of all, there, there's been no decision that the, the offer's in, um, but yeah, with the, our board's not made a, a final decision yet. I, I think it's, it will happen, well, I don't know, soon. Um, but no, I mean, we're, we're being told that we wouldn't expect there to be uh, any significant change. We only listed on the stock exchange, and we're the, I think we're the only airport in Australia listed on the stock exchange. That only happened, I think, in 2013. So up until then, we were owned by various super funds and, and the like. Um, so if, if the takeover succeeds, we'll just go back to what it was like pre-2013. I wouldn't expect there to be a significant change. I'm not up to speed with the um, the latest master plan, but 
in previous master plans, not too long ago, there was some um, proposed changes to T1 for it to be more of a linear terminal. Um, the gates are parallel to runway uh, 16 uh, right, 34 left. Yeah. And also the uh, Qantas jet base was um, going to be um, probably removed uh, an expansion of uh, T3, is it? Um, yeah, it will be T3, yeah. Are they, are, are they still in train or is that still on the plan? Well, all that will get reviewed. Our next master plan, we, we will start preparing um, probably late next year, early 23. Uh, and it'll depend on the on the forecast. But you're correct, T1 was going to be extended, you know, what's called Pier A in T1, um, to the north, towards Airport Drive. Um, in fact, just before COVID hit, we were about to publicly exhibit a proposal to do exactly that, to create four new gates down there. Okay. Uh, when demand fell off a cliff, that, that they got deferred. So there'll be a decision on that taken in the context of that next master plan. Um, on the other side, as you say, there was a, back in 2011, actually, we announced a long-term plan to also operate international from that side of the airport as well. Um, so T2, T3 would not just be domestic, it would be an international terminal as well. Again, all that gets reconsidered in the context of the next master plan. Um, it's got all sorts of benefits. For instance, you can imagine an airline like Qantas, it would be great for them to operate their international domestic services from the one um, precinct um, and Virgin Australia, of course, uh, the same. Secondly, it, it, it balances the airfield. Um, about two thirds of all activity occurs on the domestic side, one third on the international, kind of unbalanced. So you can get um, queuing on taxiways and the like. Um, even the road network gets congested um, more um, on one side of the airport than the other. So we can balance international domestic better across the airfield. It increases efficiency quite substantially. But as I said, all that'll get uh, considered in the next master plan cycle. In the early days, um, when the old FAC was basically dissolved and Sydney Airport Limited was set up, the th there were um, like three companies. It was Bankstown Airport Limited, the old Hoxton Park and Camden. Mm. Does Sydney Airport still have any holding interests in those two airports? No, no. As you said, when it was set up, Sydney Airport Corporation Limited, it was actually Sydney Airports, plural, Corporation Limited, for that reason. The, the, the holding company also ran Camden, Hoxton Park and Bankstown. Mm. Um, when the airport was leased, privatised in 2002, it was just the King, Kingsford Smith site that was leased um, and the others were leased to well, what became, I think Hoxham Park's closed down, didn't it? Oh, long time ago. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's just Bankstown and Camden are the same yeah. company uh, and we're, we're separate. There are all sorts of rules about cross-ownership of airports. So we, we couldn't buy Melbourne Airport, for instance, for obvious reasons. Several minutes ago, mention was made of this book, of which I have my copy from Bullocks to Bangs. Oh, yeah. Published in that's, that. that's the book, that's, yeah. That's it, yeah. It's a, yeah it's an excellent book. 86. Are there any more questions for Ted before perhaps we sign off for the evening? Uh, just a quick comment. I've put a link to that uh, little video in the chat. Oh, and uh, Doug Fawcett's book, uh, Pilots and Propellers, is really good on the 1930s history of it when he was. The young kid flogging sweets around the around the place to all the people coming. But uh, thank you, Ted. That was a fabulous talk, and uh, it uh, brought back a lot of memories and uh, yes, filled in you. a lot of gaps. Thank that was you. a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. We'll get out to Sydney Airport another day and start travelling. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. I'm going to sign off. Thanks for everyone and Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.